I'll smash a box here. Are you out of your mind? You ought to be. Not to be crazy, but to give you clear space. By the way, how are things in your head office? Where is your head office? For most people I know, this is their head office. The problem is, it's a really crappy office. <laughs> your head evolved to do some very sophisticated things, which you're doing right now. You're noticing in the situation, the environment, you're using long-term history and pattern recognition. That's a light, that's a person, that's a presentation. You're doing that brilliantly, computers can't even come close to that. And yet you go to the store to buy lemons and you come back with six things and no lemons. <laughs> what happened? You were using that as your office. And it sucks as an office. It really does. Your brain actually did not evolve to do a very good job at remembering, reminding, prioritizing, or managing relationships before, between guess how many things. It can do that with a certain number. Guess what that number is before you start to sub-optimize your cognitive process. New research, four things, that's it, folks. As soon as you add a fifth or a sixth, you're gonna be driven by latest and loudest. Now, I stretched that a little bit. In one of my jobs, back 45 years ago, I was waiting on tables in a cool little French restaurant in West LA. The cool thing about being a waiter in that restaurant was to see how big an order you could take without writing anything down. I got up to a six top, I could handle six people. I couldn't do seven. I could do six, standing there, casual, elegant. Slightly snobbish. Yes, I think, I mean, we're talking appetizers, you know, entrees, stuff to drink, me making recommendations between the lines. Well, I think, madam, I think, oh, excellent choice, madam, very good. I take that order from six people, casually, elegantly, walk back to, behind, as soon as I got behind the kitchen door, ah, God, I had totally maxed. That was it. Couldn't do it. And I was beginning to taste something that became a major principle that I've researched and implemented with thousands of people over thousands of hours one-on-one. -on -one. It's a basic principle of stress-free productivity. So here's, here's a big idea for you folks, and that's your mind for having ideas but not for holding them. It was not designed for that. It really wasn't. <clears throat> now, when I was just a year old, I was already using my head as my office. I could tell. <laughs> right? I mean, that's serious stuff going on. All right, oh man, jeez. And I was probably a lot more serious than I should have been. However, I had no idea what was coming toward me. As I began to grow up, that's what started to show up, right? A little more complexity in my life, right? And I started to get very hungry to find out how to stay clear amidst all of this and get into clear space. I discovered the value of having clarity and nothing in my mind. I love that freedom. I love that peacefulness. I love that sense of no distraction, of being fully present with what I'm doing. It's a high, highly cool place to be. So I, there is an image about that state, and it's possible to get to that state. I steal an image from the martial arts, mind like water. The metaphor is basically water is highly flexible, it's very fluid, and it seeks balance, and it's always totally appropriately engaged with its environment. It doesn't overreact, it doesn't underreact. If you're taking one meeting to the next emotionally, or you're taking home to work in your mind, or work to home in your mind, you're not in a mind like water state. We're talking about clear. Now, as I trained to get a black belt in karate in my 20s, I started to experience some meditative kind of exercises that are that happen in the martial arts many times. There may be a spiritual component to that, but boy, there's a real practical component to that. If four people attack you in a dark alley, you do not want 2,000 unprocessed emails hanging in your psyche, folks. <laughs> you need to be clear and clear and clear. Yo, let's go to the beer, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing on my mind, right? So I tasted the value of that. And then I started to say, well, how do I somehow take that into this more complex world that I was dealing with, not just in the martial arts, but that was such a positive, cool state to be in, in a clear space. I said, how do I bring that into my life? And began to spend the next 35 years of my, of my professional career, both researching that, formulating how to do that, and implementing that with just thousands of people. Now, a lot of people say, well, David, I could get to clear space if I had more time. <laughs> Are you kidding? There is no more time. By the way, how much time does it take to have a good idea? Zero. How much time does it take to be strategic? Zero. How much time does it take to be present, loving, 
zero. Those things don't require time, and yet most people would say those are pretty golden things to have. Strategy, being creative, being present. Yeah, no kidding. But they don't require time, but they do require something very special. What's that? You need room. Of the thousands of people that have come and taken advantage of my methodology over these years, the vast majority of them are already the most productive people you know. They don't need more time. They need more room. They're up to here with their own creativity, their own aspirations, and their own productivity. They just got no more space. But because they've been successful, they know they could do a lot more if they had more room. By the way, what would you do if you had more room? Right now, what if you had nothing on your mind? Zero. Nothing pulling on you. How would you use it? Would you just be more creative? Would you be more strategic? Being able to see things in a longer horizon instead of down in the weeds so much? Or would you just be present and be able to watch your girl play soccer without being on your phone? That's transformational for a lot of folks, just to be there. Now, just being present is a very healthy place to be. You get more blood to the brain, you'll, be, you know, you'll feel better, you'll be more relaxed. However, there's a very practical reason to be that, because the more present you are, the more you're gonna to be toward that productive state, which is relaxed, focused, in control, with situational awareness. Which, by the way, because it's such a productive state, makes you ready for what's coming toward you that you can't see yet. And by the way, everyone in the room has something coming toward you. Either challenge or opportunity that's gonna to totally blow the heck out of what you think you ought to be doing. Come on, the only thing that's different these days is how frequently things are. So it's coming up. But if you are not in a present state, you will over or underreact. So this is a very practical reason to have that clear space and to do what you need to do to do that. It's actually learning this art of how do you manage the flow of life's work. And I mean work in a very broad sense. You know, anything you want to get done that's not done yet. Everything from changing a light bulb to changing your career. But you actually all do behaviors and practices that are part of this methodology about how do you get clear. You're doing, you're do, at least to some degree. How many of you have ever taken something home to edit or review and you had to bring that back the next day to the office or to a meeting? I mean, mission critical. Do not forget this. What, did you, what strategies did you employ the night before to ensure that you wouldn't forget it and would take it in the morning? Ever put anything on your keys? Ever put anything in front of the door? <laughs> For this, you got higher education? <laughs> actually, it actually is quite smart, because the night before, some party was smart and conscious enough to realize that whoever was gonna try to walk through the door in the morning may barely be conscious if at all. What the hell is this? Oh, oh that's right, gotta take that with me, damn. <laughs> Class act, actually it is. See, the night before, you were smart enough to make a smart decision and put something in a smart place so that you can be kind of dumb and thick and stupid and still do a smart thing. I hope you got that. I've spent thousands of hours one-on-one -on -one with some of the best and brightest people. They, yeah, they had stuff in front of the door and they had a calendar, they had a few things, but then we spent time unloading every still, everything still banging around in their head. Guess how long it takes the typical mid to senior level professional to unload everything going on in their head office? One to six hours. Most of you have no idea how many commitments you have made that are banging around internally. The woulds, could, shoulds, need tos, ought tos, might want tos. That's a huge inventory. Now, a lot of people call that information overload. Nah, it's not information overload. If, that, if information overload was an issue, you'd walk into a library and die. <laughs> if information overload was the problem, this would be a much more stressful environment than this. Just the opposite. Interestingly enough, if I wanted to drive you nuts, I'm going to take away all your information and input. It's called sensory deprivation. Really. There is still an overwhelming thing that happens, though. There still is overload. It's not information overload. What is it? It's potential meaning and relevance overload. See, out in nature, there are not that many things i got to decide about, make decisions about, or act on. Yeah, then maybe there's a bear up in that cave and the river's rising and the baby's crying and there might be some berries in that bush. That's about it. The problem is every email you've got, every thought banging around in your head has a hidden berry, thunderstorm, bear in it. And you're going to have to take every one of those and make those decisions and get clear about it. Otherwise, it's going to bang around in your head. 
And when that happens, if that's doing that, the response that most people have is somewhere between burnout and crazy busy. Now, I've been teaching people how to unload that stuff. You know, get it out of your head, get it out of your psyche, get it into an external brain, you know, for 35 years and some version of that. I was doing a seminar about 20 years ago, though, and I had a, a woman in the seminar. She was a research psychologist in one of the Boston, hospital, Boston universities. And she came up to me, she said, David, you know what you're teaching? I go, well, what am I teaching? She said, distributed cognition. I said, you mean write it down? She said, well, that's another way to say it. <laughs> you know what she calls that? Cognitive artifact. <laughs> we laugh, but she was at the very beginning of something for the next 20 years that's become a huge field. You know, and Mark alluded to a, a, a good bit of that information already out there in terms of how our cognitive process works and what makes it work well and what undermines it that then gets in the way of that process. Distributed cognition, basically it's the art of being able to control your focus by having a solid external trigger for it. Because what we've discovered is that the way the brain works is it relies heavily on the current situation and environment. It's doing that brilliantly. And if you appropriately manage these practices, then what happens is you've got an external memory trigger that gives you all the possibilities of actions you have in the moment that then you can use your intelligence and your intuition to make choices of it. How many of you have ever made a list of errands you need to run? Okay, well, duh. I've got about eight right now on my errands list. You know, once I decided the next actions on the stuff, I you know, stuck them on a list. Why? My brain now does not need to remember what my errands are. My brain is used to look at the list when I'm going out and make a good intelligent choice about how I manage it. And you're all doing probably versions of that. I'm just making that explicit. So if you really wanted to have a clear head, <laughs> the problem is, is what most people are doing, your head is still spinning like a rat in a cage about all the things you need to think about, about how, what you need to think about, what you need to think about, how you need to think about what you need to think about, how you need to think about what you ought to be thinking about. And you never actually, this is, can you folks relate to this? But you never finish the exercise, it keeps spinning, right? You don't want to do that. Now, a wise man about 100 years ago said this, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. And thinking, that is operations of thought, are like cavalry charges in a battle. They're strictly limited in number, they require fresh horses, and must only be made at decisive moments. So to Mark's point, you need, you need what you can do to rest the mind and use it in extremely important times and to focus when it does that. Now, recently there's been a good bit of, of scholarly work done uh, about this whole field of co in cognitive research. A uh, well-known uh, uh, operating surgeon in, in Boston, a man named Dr. Atul Gavande, wrote this fabulous book, Checklist Manifesto. And basically, he's talking about checklists as critical so that if you're taking any kind of behavior that has critical pieces to it, you don't want to make any mistake. How many of you use checklists about anything? Yeah, I've got 75 things on my travel checklist. <laughs> and the checklist got created because I forgot every one of them once. <laughs> right? Once a philosopher, twice an idiot. But his a really cool point he makes is once you have a checklist, your brain gets to relax about all that and it opens it up for other possibilities. Any of you ever made a shopping list and you went somewhere and you trusted your list? So it gave you the freedom to buy some other stuff too. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, look at that. Whereas, wait a minute, what do we need? What, oh, come on. <clears throat> Just recently, The Organized Mind by Dan Levitt and he's head of cognitive research at McGill University in Montreal. His basic point was, look guys, and he's got a lot of data, a lot of perspectives, is you need the external brain these days, especially with what's coming toward us. It's not slowing down, folks. You know, you really need to clear that space if you want to get good at this stuff. Uh, much about what Mark was talking about that is, is, is really validated. Dr. Theo Componoli uh, in Brussels, he is a neuropsychiatrist, he is a psychotherapist, and a practicing physician. Right. And this guy has curated the, the latest 650 research projects on how the brain works and what you need to do to make sure you optimize it. And his conclusion is the most valuable thing you can do in relationships and in intersections with people is be present. And that's not free. There are things you need to do to be able to do that. And these guys, Roy Baumeister and John Tierney, wrote an incredible book about willpower. And they actually came to visit me in California because they wondered how come 
you know, I had come up with all this stuff that they, that they wound up with the same conclusions with a huge amount of research. And basically, one of the cool points about that, is, as well as that you need to have, you know, don't keep any more than four things in your mind or you're going to sub-optimize your ability to perceive and perform. But they said, basically, you don't need to finish stuff to clear your mind. You, your mind just needs to trust that there's a place that it'll see the right thing at the right time and it lets it go. And these two guys from the Free University of Brussels, they read my book and kind of blew them away. They spent a good bit of deep, deep research in cognitive science uh, about why that worked. And a lot of that's just your brain just works too hard when it tries to remember. It can recognize brilliantly, but it can't recall worth crap. And basically, in terms of just how you're wired, your brain is very active and dynamic, and it actually needs things to hold space out here in order for it to make sure that stuff gets done. Because you can't trust your mind is moving too fast. It needs the external brain. And by the way, one of those guys, interestingly enough, his expertise was insect behavior. Any of you ever had two ants in your kitchen and then 200? <laughs> what happened? Well, the ant's DNA is programmed to go hunt for food, the worker ant. They find it, they go, hmm, food, then they're programmed to take it back to the nest. But as they're taking food back, they're dropping pheromones, a trail. The next ant shows up, goes, hmm, pheromones, yo, dude, food? <laughs> and they go that way until the food runs out, then the ants run out, right? In other words, they've grown and evolved with basically they're dumb, they have got no memory, but they get a lot of cool stuff done. <laughs> it is so nice to have the freedom to be dumb, not have to remember a thing, and get a bunch of cool stuff done. No, I'm not kidding, really. So, you know, here's the big idea, folks. Stop using your head as your office. Get that stuff out of your head, however you're going to do that. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. Get out of your mind. Not to be crazy, but to clear it for the cool things your mind is for. Being more creative, more strategic, more loving, more present. Just more able to do all that. It makes the navigation of life a lot more fun. Trust me. Thanks for listening.